All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Can everybody hear me OK? So this is actually stepping off the framework treadmill with web components. I forgot to uh, retitle the slide there. But uh, if that's what you're aiming to see, you're in the right place. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Nelson. Glad everybody's here today. Um, so how many, just quick survey, how many people were here for the last session right before mine? OK, so half-ish. So I think some of our stuff might overlap pretty heavily. I'll try to go through that as fast as I can, but hopefully I'll have some different areas that I'll be focusing on. Um, but uh, just a brief introduction. Uh, I'm Chris Nelson. I'm one of the co-founders of Gaslight. We're a web and mobile app development shop here in Cincinnati. Uh, one of the things I do is I run an apprenticeship program, which is designed to take people who have learned coding skills through whatever means and uh, partner them with a mentor and kind of guide them into the field of software development. So if that's something you're at all interested in, please come hit me up later. Uh, but that's not really what I'll be talking about today. Um, what I am going to be talking about today, uh, I'm going to start with kind of a brief history of uh, my adventure in web application development. I've been doing web app development since the web was a thing back in you know, 95, 96, so a really long time. So uh, I kind of want to give some historical context around uh, why I think these ideas are worth pursuing. I'm going to talk about like a preferred future, what I would like to see, and hopefully, uh, hopefully there's some consensus on that, but where I would like to see us go in terms of web application development. And then I'm going to talk about, I think, how we can get there with some of the uh, emerging standards that have come along just in the last few years. So uh, I do got a lot to go through, so I'll probably try to keep it moving fairly quick. But if you do have a question, please uh, raise your hand, and I'll, I'll try to get to you when I can. Uh, and we'll have lots of code examples as well, so hopefully that's of interest to people. Um, so um, just to set a little context, I'm definitely not here to like slam on frameworks or any framework in particular. Um, before frameworks, I was doing a lot of JavaScript, and it was just sort of like nasty, just wads of JavaScript puked all over the HTML page, and that was awful. And, uh, and then uh, the first framework that I really got um, familiar with was Backbone, and it was so much better than the nothing I had before, which was just basically raw jQuery hanging out all over the place. Uh, even jQuery was much better than wh what came before. Um, and Backbone gave some structure to my applications, and that was really awesome. And then Angular came along, and I loved Angular, uh, the first version. It was much better than Backbone. It had some really cool ideas around uh, using components to develop apps, um, binding, which you know uh, is a double-edged sword in the end, but it, it, it gave me some power. Uh, and then after that, I moved on to React. Um, that was a little less voluntary, and maybe I didn't fall in love quite as much, but over time, I realized there's some amazing ideas in React in terms of how to manage state in a large, complex application. So, um, you know, I definitely want to give credit to web application frameworks for giving us much better ideas and much better tools for building web apps. And uh, just to point out a few of the really good ideas that I feel like have come out of web frameworks and they've made our lives much better. Um, reusable components are something I'm a really big fan of. And I first got experience with that really in, um, well, in server-side development. But I'm not even going to bother with that story because that's too long. Um, but in client-side development, I first got familiar with uh, components in, uh, in Angular. And uh, it was a really cool thing, and one of the really awesome things, as well as components being a great way to uh, manage code in a larger application, uh, the cool thing about components, if you have a really good framework that embraces them and gives you a good model for them, uh, a lot of times you can have a third-party ecosystem of components. So if you're doing something common, like an autocomplete or a tree control, you might be able to use something, a, a third-party open source component. Um, one of the other really good ideas that I've seen come out of frameworks is a way to manage state in a large application. Uh, and React, I think, kind of led the charge with this. And uh, the basic idea here that I think has the most legs is this idea of one-way data flow. Uh, the Ember community calls it data down, actions up. So data goes into a component that renders itself, 
and it somehow emits actions for what happens. And by using those two ideas, and I'll go into this in more detail, we can really break up the state for a large application and manage it in a predictable way and in a testable way. So um, here's kind of where I'm at, though. Um, I've seen these uh, really great application frameworks come along, and I've embraced multiple application frameworks and, and you know, fallen in love each time. But each time, um, when I go, for instance, from Backbone to Angular, it's like, cool, here's this awesome thing, and everything you were doing before, just throw it all away. Dump it in the garbage and just start over again. And, uh, and that's kind of a painful thing to do. If you have a large application, you know, it's, it's not easy to do that. And I remember with clients trying to go like, okay, I know you have this huge backbone code base, but man, Angular is so much better. You really need to go this direction. It, it's just a painful, difficult thing. And uh, then, you know, Angular eventually kind of falls out of, Angular 1 at least, kind of falls out of favor. And now it's like, okay, we're going to React. Let's do it all again. Let's throw everything away and start over again. Uh, and after a couple times doing that, um, it, it just really made me interested in how can we kind of stop this, uh, you know, and that's kind of the title of the talk. How can we step off this treadmill? How can we keep doing this over and over again? And uh, really, the, the idea here is, do we really need another completely incompatible uh, web framework? Um, and hopefully, I can kind of convince you that there's some things that we can look at that can avoid that trap. So um, I'm going to maybe say some things that are a little controversial, but hopefully, I can back them up. So um, there were a lot of. Um, things that we've done in web application development that for their time, I am absolutely convinced were the right way to do it, were a huge uh, improvement in terms of our developer lives at the time, where if you were to do them today, uh, other people on your team would rightly take your keyboard away from you. <laughs> and um, a few of those things, um, let me put a little context on that first one. Uh, I'm not here to hate on jQuery. I thought jQuery was great. The problem that it solved was largely uh, completely incompatible versions of DOM in the browser. That's mostly gone away at this point in time. Uh, and at this point, if you're building a React component and you start to whip up some jQuery in the middle of a React component, you should stop doing that because that's not the right way to do it. Um, it was a really good idea then, probably shouldn't do it so much now. Um, and, you know, for this next one, you can jump up and punch me in the face if you want to, but I am convinced that for its time, CoffeeScript was a huge improvement over JavaScript of that era. Uh, you know, I at the time, um, it was just a much better language, and you can look at modern JavaScript and easily see the influences that CoffeeScript have on the language. If you look at the arrow function, straight out of CoffeeScript. Uh, it was a huge uh, leap forward in terms of um, really influencing the JavaScript language to be much better than it was then. Um, but if you were to start an application now and say, I would like to code it in CoffeeScript, uh, you would correctly get some resistance probably from uh, the rest of your team. It's probably not a good idea at this point in time. Uh, I would advocate there are people still doing it. Um, Things like the module system in JavaScript alone are enough to say, like, now nah, let's just like stop with anything else. Um, and here's the third one, and, and this is where maybe it gets controversial. I would suggest that although right now, where we are right now in web application development, it may not look like this. Um, if you're now working with a framework, and most of them are this way, that has its own completely proprietary component model, that may just seem fine right now, and, and maybe it is, but my claim is your future self in two to three years is gonna look back and say, wow, that was a really bad idea and I'm not gonna do that anymore. So that's like, if, that's like probably the most important takeaway from this talk in terms of the cases I'm trying to make. And here's why. We now, well, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. So what do I actually want to get to in terms of web application development? Um, the first thing I want 
is truly cross everything, browser, framework, et cetera, reusable components. If I'm developing my application using components, uh, I want that component to not be completely tied to whatever framework I'm using. If I want to move libraries or frameworks in terms of how I build components, I want my components to be able to still interoperate with one another. Um, I'd also like to uh, have, um, and this is probably a just me thing, I'm not saying this is like a everybody feels this way kind of a thing, um, but I would really like truly semantic HTML, or as I like to call it, semanticer HTML. So if you've heard of the idea of semantic HTML, it's just like using the right tag for the right idea, and that's cool. But ever since I've been a developer, I, when people first showed me HTML in 1995, I was like, that's super cool, now I'd like to write my own tag. And they were like, nope, that's not a thing. And I was like, well that sucks. So um, I was super frustrated about that. And it just turned out all I had to do was wait 20 years. <laughs> and now I can finally write my own HTML tags, which I think is really, really cool because now I can exactly express the ideas of my application as an HTML tag. And I just kind of think that's cool. Um, so uh, I also want to have manageable data flow. And I'm gonna talk about this a bit because I want my components to be able to have the data flow in the application, the state of the application, and I probably should have said state. I want the state of the application to be manageable uh, without the components, like without it being like tied into the framework. So I'd like to be able to have components in whatever library I write them be able to participate in the application uh, and state to be managed in a sensible way. Uh, I also want my application to be testable and I want a standard packaging and distribution mechanism. And this last one, that's NPM, that's kind of a subtle thing. Moving right along. So uh, what are the things that can help me get there? Sorry, my voice is about to give out. So my claim is that the web component standards that have come along, that have come out of the W3C, this is the same body that gives us HTML, uh, these standards that are now being implemented by the browsers, uh, they're there in Chrome, I think they're there now in um, either the version that's dropped or is about to drop with, with Firefox, not behind a flag anymore. Uh, and there are very good polyfills to support these if you happen to be unfortunate enough to have to support one of the other browsers. Um, these standards now take some of the awesome ideas of, web, of uh, web frameworks of the past and now bring them into the browser as directly browser available AT APIs. And uh, the web component uh, standard, if you will, is really a collection of other standards. And I'm gonna go through these uh, kind of one by one. Uh, the first one and probably the most important one is the custom element standard. That's now at V1. There was a V0 of custom elements uh, if you're seeing examples in that, like, don't don't use that anymore because V1's definitely the way everybody's going and the way you should go too. Uh, Shadow DOM, which I'll talk about uh, a good bit, is super interesting and and actually gets quite complicated. I won't have time to really go into it completely thoroughly because it's it's pretty interesting. Uh, HTML templates are really really simple. They're just a template tag that's now in your browsers that just give you a way to put a chunk of HTML in your web page, have it not rendered, but having it sitting there part of the DOM uh, available for you to work with in JavaScript. Um, custom events are not technically part of the web component standard, but I'm kind of lumping them in here because they're critical to uh, my ideas for how we might manage state in a larger application. Uh, lastly, the web component JS polyfill uh, is available for you and should do feature detection. So, uh, you know, use whatever your browser gives you, but then fall back if you need to kind of a thing. Um, so let's talk about custom elements. Uh, custom elements are, you know, the, the answer to what I've always wanted. They let me write my own HTML elements. I can define both their presentation and behavior. The way that they work is I create ES6 classes that extend from HTML element and then I register said class in the browser 
using a uh, element on window called custom elements, so I call custom elements .define, give my tag a name and an implementation class. That name has to have a dash in it. That's the only rule. Well, that's I, there may be others, but that's the main rule. Um, and that is to disambiguate uh, built-in tags from custom tags so that your browser knows what's what. Um, so, of course, that's cool, but how do we tell the tag to do something? And you know, if you are here in the last session, you've already seen some of this. Um, there are some lifecycle methods that you can implement in your custom tag class to tell it what to do. The key ones are the constructor itself. You can do work there. Uh, for every element that uses your tag on the page, it's going to construct an instance for you of that class. Um, you have an attribute changed callback that fires uh, any time an attribute that, that you're observing on your element changes, and we'll see an example of that later. And then maybe the most important one, uh, that connected callback, that fires when your element is actually uh, in the DOM. So that's really the place where it's safe to do work because it's already in the DOM and, and things are going on. So let's see an example. This is kind of the simplest example of a custom element. Uh, we have a class hello world that extends from HTML element. And we have a single method connected callback. And in that, we are just setting our inner HTML. This inside of that uh, method is going to be the element instance itself. It has all the standard DOM properties that are there on any other element on the page. So inner HTML being what it usually is, I can just set it to what I want. And uh, then I register that custom element. I have a little bit of um, duplication in that bottom code. Um, but basically, the point is I'm bringing in my hello world uh, class, and I'm registering it. And once I register it, I can use it on the page just like any other element. Uh, just to see it in action, prepare to be surprised and amazed. It prints out hello world, yay! <laughs> OK, not really that impressive, but you can see it happen. Uh, and by the time it's fired, it's already added hello world uh, to what's inside of it. But uh, the original source code for the page was an empty hello world element. So not too much, but that's OK. We're starting simple. Um, when we want to do more interesting things with our elements, um, it's probably start time to start talking about the spooky shadow DOM. Uh, and the shadow DOM um, is a really, really interesting API. And what it fundamentally gives you is completely encapsulated DOMs within the larger DOMs. So um, if you're talking about custom elements that are really designed to be reusable uh, completely, and you want complete control over the look and feel of your custom elements, um, Shadow DOM is the tool that you want. And that is because by creating a Shadow DOM, uh, inside of that DOM uh, for my custom elements, I can have my own style that only applies inside of that DOM. And CSS, CSS classes are only working inside of that box. I have no leakage of CSS classes from outside of the Shadow DOM to inside of the Shadow DOM or vice versa. Um, so in that manner, I can completely control what my element looks like and how it works. Um, in order to let me pass in things into my Shadow DOM, if I want to let the user style certain bits, um, there are options there, but they're kind of a little bit of a work in progress, so I'm not going to go into them during this talk. But if you want to know more, you can hit me up after that, and I'll tell you what I know. Um, but the basic way that Shadow DOM works is I have a method on my custom element called attach shadow. Um, it takes an object. Um, with really just a single attribute mode. Uh, you always want to set the mode to be open. Uh, if you set it to close, bad things happen, and we'll leave it at that. Um, and what that will do is it will create a shadow root property on your element 
that shadow root is the DOM itself. Um, like I said, it's totally encapsulated. Selectors from the outer page don't apply and CSS in the shadow DOM will not leak out. And let's see what that looks like in an example. Uh, this is the very simple hello world kind of shadow DOM example. I'm setting up with attach shadow and then instead of calling this.innerHTML, I just call this.shadowroot.innerHTML. And in this example, uh, I have a style element inside of my shadow DOM where I'm saying anything with class shadow gets a shadow. Surprise, surprise. And then I create an H1 with class shadow. Um, the text there is kind of giving you a hint of what my example is going to look like, but let's actually go on to that. In my HTML for this, uh, what I'm setting up, just so that we can see that what I'm saying is true, uh, I have some style in the outer DOM where I'm saying all H1 should be red. Um, and then in my uh, page uh, HTML, I'm making another H1 whose class is shadow. And what we'll see there, when we actually look at this example, is that first element, even though it has the class shadow, it doesn't get a shadow, but it's red. And then the custom element here, because its CSS says, uh, give me a shadow if I have class shadow, it gets the shadow, but the outer, uh, the outer style doesn't apply. So that's DOM encapsulation kind of in a nutshell. Cool. So, interesting fun fact. Uh, Shadow DOM's actually not as new as you might think. Um, Shadow DOM uh, is actually taking something that was already available in browsers, Chrome specifically, and giving me as a developer access to it, which I thought was super interesting. Um, if we look at a, an example here, you can actually, uh, that's not the right one, you can actually see here an HTML5 progress element. I don't know, does anybody actually use progress elements? I can't say that I do. It's a thing. Uh, there's actually a progress element built into HTML5 now. Uh, sorry, it's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do an inspect. There's actually a progress element in HTML5 and you can give it a max and a value and it will do that. There's actually a setting in Chrome Inspector uh, that you can look at to say, show me the user agent shadow DOM. And if you turn that on, you can actually see the internal implementation of HTML5 elements, which it turns out under the covers are just HTML and CSS. So it's like turtles all the way down. Um, but I thought that was kind of cool. So, you know, Shadow DOM is kind of like not a new made up experiment. It's more like they took something that works and extracted it out and made it available. So I just thought that was an interesting uh, little tidbit. You can see here, if you go far enough down, it's just basically making a div with a width. Pretty unexciting, but kind of cool. So, um, Let's talk about maybe the more, um, more complicated bit of Shadow DOM, and I'm not going to probably have time to go into this in tremendous detail, but it is really, really interesting. Um, Shadow DOM has a feature called slots that let me do composition with Shadow DOM. Essentially, that let me use a Shadow DOM as a template, and we'll see what this looks like. I think it'll probably make more sense. But when you're talking about shadow DOM, you've seen what a shadow DOM is. Um, you can also have markup inside of your custom element that you put there when you're the page author. That is called the light DOM inside of a custom element. This will make more sense when you see an example probably. But um, that light DOM, um, what the shadow DOM does with slots is it will merge the light DOM with the shadow DOM. It will fill the shadow DOM with elements from the light DOM. Uh, so it's smerging the light DOM and the shadow DOM. And of course, as everybody knows, that brings balance to the force, which is a good thing. Um, and 
the way that that works is with the slot element. Basically, uh, in a nutshell, the light DOM gets rendered into the slot. So um, that's a lot of words, but I feel like this concept is much easier to understand in code. So let's go look at code. Um, this is a hello slots example. Um, this is not really any much more interesting than our previous shadow DOM example. The only thing different here is we're having a slot element. And the other thing that's different is when we use the element on the page, uh, I'm sorry, I should have fixed that slide. That's from a previous conference. My bad. Um, when we actually see this element used on the page, we have some content inside of that element. And what the slots do for us is they'll take that content that the page author has put inside of our element and just basically put it in the slot. So um, the outcome of all this is unsurprisingly, I will see my custom element and it will use that hi there bit as a template and it will pick what was in there and stick it in the slot. Just to see that in action, we have hello slots. This is the light DOM. And if we drill into our shadow DOM, we can actually see the slot is kind of like giving us a little hint as like where it's getting the content for its slot. Um, slots get more complicated. I can have multiple slots and give them names, um, but they let me do really powerful things. So I'm gonna go on to a more complex example that I'm not gonna try to walk through line by line in the interest of time, but I just kinda wanna give you a feel for like what, what this is moving towards. So I talked earlier about semantic curve markup, and uh, what I'm really talking about, um, just to set up this example, I'm making a little uh, flight checklist. So if you were a pilot and you were walking around your airplane, you wanna check a bunch of stuff. I'm just making a little checklist for that kind of a scenario. Um, and basically I'm using Bootstrap, because that's what you do, um, to make it look nice. And uh, so because I'm doing that, I have a lot of markup with a lot of classes, because Bootstrap. Um, but really, if you look at all this markup, it's not at all clear, like, what is that thing? And um, what I'd really like to do is move from that kind of markup to that kind of markup. I want to have a flight checklist to say, this whole thing's a checklist, and then what I actually care about is just like, this is a checklist item, and here's, here's what it is. That's what I actually care about as like an application, as a user of this component. So in order to do that, I have to have multiple custom elements working together and rendering their content in the right spot. And that's what Shadow DOM actually, with slots and composition, can do. Um, just to show how this actually turns out in action. This is uh, what the checklist ends up looking like, like. And we can actually see uh, this is um, just a big flight checklist element. And it's just got checklist items in there. And each checklist item has a shadow DOM and it has some content. Um, but basically, on the page source, the only thing I'm sticking in there is each checklist item. So left wheel, epinage, tail, so on and so forth. Um, so this gets a little complicated in terms of you have shadow DOMs within shadow DOMs. Um, but it's a powerful tool to be able to make like really, really expressive uh, HTML. All right. So I'm doing OK on time. But I'm going to keep it moving. Um, Actually, I'm a little ahead of where I thought I'd be. Um, oh, well, that's OK. Uh, so let's talk about data flow. Um, I think this you know, is one of those things that at least was very interesting to me. Um, so how many people have seen this diagram before? A uh, few of you. If you've used React, this is basically stolen from Flux. This is basically the Flux pattern that Redux actually implements. and Basically, it's just one-way data flow. Uh, so I have actions in my application that just say, something happened. Actions go to a dispatcher. A dispatcher updates a store. 
and then a store is responsible for updating the views. Uh, and really there should be probably another line that goes back towards action because views might dispatch actions when interesting things happen. Um, so it's a very, it, it lets me do things like say my views just take data in and render themselves when data changes. They're, they're really simple. Uh, if I have a uh, component that's kind of following this pattern, if I give it, all I have to test is that if I give it data, does it render it the right, right way? And when the user does something, does it emit the right event? Because that's all it can do. It can render data, it can dispatch events, that's it. So it lets me keep things simple and testable. And I like that. So um, when I started playing around with web components in earnest, uh, what I really wanted to kind of find out is like, could I actually implement this pattern uh, without necessarily using a framework? So um, my first kind of spike, I just use Redux. You can totally do that. That's totally fine. Uh, it will work. But I just kind of wanted to see, do I actually need that or not? Um, and uh, I'll share the results of my experiment, but just to cut to the chase, mostly you can. You can do it yourself, uh, and it's not really very much code at all. So um, let me kind of uh, set up just a little bit. Um, a key thing that I used in my approach to managing state with my web component apps is I used custom events. Um, custom events are really well supported across browsers. Um, I, th I know Edge does, and I think even IE 11 does, but all the other browsers do as well. Um, they're really simple. Basically, it's just what the name implies. Instead of being limited to the events that are built into your browser, like click events, etc., uh, I can make up my own events, and I can give them a name, and in my event object, there's a detail property where I can just stick in whatever payload I want. So why is this interesting? Hopefully that'll be clear in just a minute. But now I'm gonna set up um, my three simple rules for managing state in my web component application. Um, here's kind of what the, the constraints that I'm setting for myself. Um, I'm saying that data comes into my web component via attributes or properties, uh, not you know somewhere else. Um, components re-render themselves however they see fit when new data comes in. So it's their job to be able to notice when those attributes or properties change and do whatever they feel is appropriate. Uh, components can also emit custom events when something interesting happens. So if a user's doing a thing, uh, they emit a custom event to say at an application level, what's going on. So, and that's why, of course, custom events start getting interesting. Basically what I'm, and you know, I probably should have called this out. I'm using custom events to kind of fill the same thing that if you were building a Redux app, you would do with actions. So, um, let's talk about a very thin abstraction that I made in 30 lines of JavaScript to be able to deal with all this. Um, I'm following the patterns of Flux and I'm using reducers and subscribers, which if you're familiar with Redux, you've seen before, but just really quickly, um, I have reducers that are just functions that take two things. They take the current state for the application and they take an event that happened. So in my case, it's gonna be the payload from a custom action. And with those two things, the current state the custom event is what happened, they emit a new state for the overall application. So that's it, pretty simple. I have one other thing, which is our subscribers. Subscribers get notified every time the application state changes and they update some component that cares about a particular portion of the state. So reducers get actions and they can emit a new state which is essentially a state change. And subscribers go and tell the component that cares, here's a new state. Um, when I set those things up in my application, there's one function that I call called connect that just kind of like wires everything together. 
So um, for my example, and uh, wow, we have actually more time than uh, I had when I gave this talk last, but that's okay. Um, Bus Detective is an application that we uh, wrote at Gaslight a few years ago. Uh, and um, basically, when we first moved downtown, like almost four years ago, um, you know, a lot of people were taking the buses because we were downtown, and uh, there was no really good way to figure out where a bus actually was. And um, so one of our developers, um, Kevin Rockwood, I think it was, um, somehow figured out that there was actually a real-time feed of bus information that Metro was publishing and nobody was using to do anything. <laughs> as ridiculous as it sounds, that was the case. Uh, so we basically just built an application to grab that data feed and tell you where your bus was going to be. Uh, we built that application, uh, had a Ruby on Rails backend, and I think it used a JavaScript framework yeah, it used a JavaScript framework called Ember on the front end to display that. Uh, and then we wrapped it inside of a Cordova wrapper so that we could put it out there as a mobile app. Um, we have since uh, kind of like completely rewrote it now because, uh, you know, technology moves on and there's much better options for doing some of the things that we're doing. And this new version we're calling Bus Detective NG because we're super creative. Uh, Bus Detective Next Generation. And... Uh, that is a completely different uh, technical stack. It's using Elixir on the back end, um, which I don't have time to talk about. That's not what my talk is about. But if you're interested, Elixir is really, really cool. It's much better at doing applications like this that are real time. Um, in our previous application, we were doing polling to see, like, did something happen? Did something happen? Did something happen? Uh, with Elixir now, you can actually push things right to the front end super easily, which we'll see. Um, but on the front end, um, basically what we took is we like threw all the JavaScript framework code away entirely and basically initially just went to server-side rendering and to see how much we could get away with, essentially. Uh, and then as we needed to, basically we just introduced web components uh, to, to do the bits that needed to be highly interactive. Um, so I'm gonna start with showing you what it looks like, and then we're gonna dive into this code. Um, and since we have a fair bit of time, you can ask lots of questions. I'll start with like one sort of component that kind of illustrates my ideas of managing state, and we can look at more things if we want to. Um, but <coughs> this is it running. Um, I have and this is designed to be in a, uh, in a mobile UI, so it kind of looks a little bit silly in a desktop, but that's okay. Um, let's say I have a favorite stop. I can actually see where my buses are in real time. And if we l wait long enough that actually Metro updates, which is every few seconds, uh, we can see those buses move around on the map. Uh, if what I'm really interested in is the map itself, and we saw one just come in there, we can expand it and actually see more buses. And uh, yeah, there's not a lot of buses. I'm just glad there were a few, to be honest with you. But if you saw it at rush hour, they'd be all over the place. Um, so basically, it's just showing where my buses are in more or less real time on a map. So um, let's actually, oh, cool, one moved. Let's actually see how this worked. Um, and we'll look at the code for bus detective. So I'm gonna start with two different components and talk about how they fit together and how they work. Um, sorry, just to back up and show you in the UI what I'm talking about. What I'm gonna be looking at is this little guy here, which is expand map. So he's a component that just does that, that's it. And then I'm going to look at the map component itself, which of course has to know when it's expanded or contracted. So I'm using that because it's kind of a simpler piece of the app, um, which you know gets fairly complicated as you might guess. But expand map, he actually uh, has that button that toggles 
and what it actually does on click. Uh, I have a dispatch method that I've basically just used to wrap dispatching a custom event. And all it does is create a custom event of the given name. So I'm naming my application specific custom event expand map. And the payload for that event just has a map expanded property that's true or false. So I can expand map true or I can expand map false. I could have made it like an expand map and a contract map, but I didn't do that. So that toggle button just like fires this event. Um, but it's actually the stop map, map that actually needs to know whether uh, it's expanded or contracted. So let's see how that fits together. Uh, my reducers and subscribers are in this file uh, I just called container. And uh, like I said, subscribers, their job is to take the new state and update an element that cares. So we'll look at that first. I have the subscriber for BD stop map. That's the map itself. Um, it does a lot of things, so it cares about a lot of things. But for what we're talking about here, this is where it actually gets the map expanded off of the state. And all it does is set attributes on the component. So when this function get it gets invoked, it gets the state and the matching element. So the way the syntax reads is I give it a selector and it will invoke my selector, it will invoke my function for every state change passing in whatever that selector matches, the first thing that it matches. So we have a stop map element, we just set its expanded attribute. How that works inside of stop map, although there's a lot going on, Uh, if we go down, oops, I lost the thread, my bad. If we go to the attribute change callback, the attribute change callback that calls, it gets called when attributes change. Um, when we, when that subscriber function got invoked, it called set attribute. That will trigger the attribute change callback. And here's where we're actually doing the work. We're saying if we're expanded or not, uh, we're going to basically just add a class or remove a class. Um, this dot expanded, just to show you what's going on there, um, just to make my code a little bit more manageable, I've made synthetic getters for all my attributes. Um, so in the case of the expanded attribute, I'm just calling this dot get attribute. And since all attributes are strings, uh, I'm basically just checking for true or false. So that's how expand map works. Um, so that's two components talking to each other, but they know, have no direct knowledge of one another. Um, the first version of this code, expand map just like reached into stop map and manipulated it. Um, the reason that that's not so cool is basically you're, you, you're now your, your components are kind of like intertwined and they're not useful by themselves. And if I wanted to write my stop map component using Polymer and my expand map component using Stencil, for example, uh, and they're manipulating one another directly, uh, I probably have, you know, a lot less isolation and it's a lot, you know, I'm much more constrained. So the reason that I, I dig this approach generally, um, it lets me keep things simple at the component level. It also keeps things really decoupled and by keeping things decoupled and saying the web component is the unit of work in my application, uh, I have freedom to, you know, to do what I want as, you know, if, I div if this application were to grow and have multiple teams working on it, uh, you know, I could have one team that was like, we're all about stencil and another team that was all about something else or even more likely, we could start saying like stencil's the one true way and later on go, oh wait, it's garbage, let's go here. And we would still be okay as long as we were sticking with web components. And that's not to say anything in particular about stencil. I I'm just picking something out of the air. Um, it's freedom that I really want though. Um, 
So let's see. Let's go back to my slides and see if I uh, am forgetting anything. Otherwise, we can just like keep looking at bus detectives. Oh, yeah. So I just had another slide. Um, and yeah, we can do questions, and I can dig into bus component more since we have a few more minutes. But a um, few things that I think are definitely worth checking out. Um, oh, yeah, by the way, if, you're, if you weren't here in the talk before, uh, the thing he showed, nutmeg, I thought was really, really cool. That's not on the slide because I just saw it yesterday when I was looking at the agenda. But I do think it's worth checking out. Um, webcomponents.org is kind of a overall community of web components. It's definitely worth checking out to see what's out there. Um, Polymer is a Google library that's all about how can we make uh, building applications with a web components a uh, better experience for developers. It has an interesting little sub project called Lit HTML, which is a way, it's a very, very thin, simple library that's all about. Um, building uh, custom elements that render using a uh, string literal, which is a newer feature in modern JavaScript. And it basically lets you build your components template in a string literal, but it will manage it like a virtual DOM and optimize for performance for you under the covers. So it's pretty cool and worth checking out. Uh, Skate.js is another really thin library for building web components that I think is working out, or I think is, is worth checking out. Um, and then there are a bunch of other things over at webcomponents.org that kind of list, here's a bunch of libraries for building things in web components. Um, so because I have a little bit more time, maybe I'll also show you, um, oh, that's me, so if you're interested in stuff like that. Um, but maybe let's look at um, how uh, those buses actually get to the map itself, because that's a little more complicated, but probably a little bit more interesting. Um, if we look in our app.js, this is like the top level file that I load for the application. Um, I'm pulling in all my custom elements. I'm registering them one by one on the page. The question I always get asked is, could the custom elements registration just happen in the file that declares the custom element? You could totally do it that way. I would say most people do it that way. I just like the idea of if I'm using a, cu a custom element class, I might want to decide what the tag name is as the consumer of that uh, class. And I think it's interesting to have that flexibility. Do you need it? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I'm pulling in uh, connect and dispatch from my little tiny library, uh, WC Fluxish. That's literally just 30 lines of code that wires things together. Um, and what I'm doing down here is I'm actually listening to uh, web sockets. And basically, when data comes in over the web socket from the server, I'm dispatching custom events into my application. So one of the things here that is the actual bus position, so that's what causes the buses to move around the map. Uh, I'm listening to uh, Phoenix channels, which are just a little abstraction over web sockets. And when I get a message vehicle positions, I basically dispatch a custom event called update vehicle positions. And in my container, I have a reducer, which basically just gets vehicle positions off the custom event and puts it on the state. So it's a super simple uh, reducer. And then in the stop map itself, uh, leaflet is the uh, the actual JavaScript library that renders that map. And if I look down here and display vehicles, that's where I'm actually putting, I'm basically removing the old bus markers and um, putting them on there again, I think. So I'm making a bus icon. It's been a while since I looked at this code, I'm sorry. Um, I'm 
looking for all the oh okay so I'm basically removing things that have fallen off the map <coughs> but if they're already there I'm updating them rather than like removing them and adding them again <coughs> and that's so I can have some CS trans CSS transitions that fire to animate the movement a little bit um, I have some even more complicated stuff in here about when buses are new and when they're old. So I want to animate them going away and coming in. Um, so there's some complexity around that. But um, essentially, that's how, that's how the bus positions get to the map. 